Good morning, I am back. Now you'll have to catch me again. Um, we now have the service going and we have the broadcast up. So as we begin this morning, sorry about having to take that break. We had a little Wi-Fi confusion here at my house. Okay, so this morning we will be uh, starting with a uh, few announcements. Uh, really, the only one that we have is that, remember, with Logos on Wednesday, that we follow the Anderson Public uh, School calendar. So if they uh, dismiss early or if they are closed that day, we will not have Logos. I know we have more weather, uh, but we will uh, look forward to seeing everybody at Logos on Wednesday. Okay. This morning we're going to do a little bit of our worship service. Uh, as far as uh, some of the scripture reading and the litany, and then I will share as uh, we move through this and have a time of prayer. So, this morning our first passage comes from Isaiah chapter 59, starting with verse 8. At just the right time, I will respond to you. On the day of salvation, I will help you, I will protect you, and give you to the people as my covenant with them. Through you I will reestablish the land of Israel and assign it to its own people again. I will say to the prisoners, come out in freedom. To those in darkness, come into the light. They will be my sheep, grazing in green pastures and on hills that were previously bare. They will be my sheep, grazing in green pastures. They will neither hunger nor thirst. The searing sun will not reach them anymore. For the Lord in his mercy will lead them. He will lead them beside cool waters, and I will make my mountains into level paths for them. The highways will be raised above the valley. See, my people will return from far away, from lands to the north and west, and from as far south as Egypt. Sing for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on them in their suffering. This is Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 through 13. This is the word of the Lord. The first part of our litany this morning says, Come and see. The light of God has come into our world to proclaim God's justice and love. It has overcome the darkness and brought new life. These words echo the words that we find in our gospel lesson today, which is from John chapter 1, the first 18 verses. I'm actually using uh, Marianne Thompson's translation from her commentary um, as we read this this morning. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and this life was the light of all human beings. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness to the light so that all might come to believe through him. He was not the light, rather he came to bear witness to the light. The true light that, light that sheds light on every person was coming into the world. Even though he was in the world and even though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own home, but his own people did not welcome him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the authority to become God's children. They are not begotten of blood, nor of human desire, nor of the will of man. They are begotten of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, so that we saw his glory. Glory is the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John bears witness concerning him, and has declared, This is the one to whom I said, The one who comes after me takes precedence over me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received abundant grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is ever at the Father's side, and he has made God known to us. This is the word of the Lord. The second half of our litany says, Come and follow. Christ, our companion, has redeemed our world. He draws us into a loving family from every tribe and family and culture. 
At Maple Grove, we do really focus on family and the way that we can love and care for one another and support one another. And this morning, we are excited to announce that we are welcome to our family a new, new member. Meredith and Josiah on Tuesday welcomed their new boy, Jack Denton Kuntz. He was born, he's set with seven pounds and 10 ounces, 19 and a half inches long, and we're uh, excited for them, and we look forward to being able to uh, greet him in person. As we come to our prayer time this morning, uh, we do want to have a few requests that we do want to continue to remember. We want to continue to remember Lou and Mary Jean. Uh, it's been a rough week for Lou. Um, we want to continue to lift up Mary Jean and Lou and all of those that um, are caring for Lou. As many of you uh, are aware of, and some may not be, this week we had to move my mother, Kathy Delisle. Um, she went to the hospital for a few days, and now she's at the Woodlands Care Facility here in Muncie in the Alzheimer's unit. Um, please be praying for her as she transitions in this adjustment, but also for Dad, as he is, uh, Bill, as he is not um, struggling with this. And we just ask that uh, God would work in this situation. We want to continue to remember Gleason and Lorraine and bring some healing there, uh, physical healing, and continue to watch over Miss Olive. As you know, she is home from the nursing home after her hip replacement, um, but continue to lift her up as she lives there by herself. I know that many of us have other concerns that we lift to the Lord this morning. And as we come together, let us just pause and agree in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day of life. We thank you for the opportunity to gather as your family and come before your throne. And even over Facebook and the internet to be together as the family of God. And we thank you for your love, which embraces us and surrounds us. Your love, which keeps us warm on these cold days. Your love, which reminds us that we are never alone, but we are always with you because you are always with us. Lord, as we come this morning into your presence, we just celebrate the birth of baby Jack. We thank you for bringing Meredith safely through the delivery and for the healthy baby, and pray that you would bless her and Josiah as they begin raising this child. Lord, thank you uh, for this miracle of life and this reminder of new life. And Lord, there are others that are walking at the other end of life spectrum, and we going through difficult times and need your touch. We lift up Lou and Mary Jean. We lift up Bill and Kathy, Gleason and Lorraine. We lift up Miss Olive. Lord, you know each need there, each struggle they face, we just pray that your hand would be there. Lord, you know the concerns and burdens in our own lives, those that need physical touch, those that need your provision, those that need wisdom or the healing of relationships. Lord, we just pray that you'd work in each of these. We pray that you would be with those that we pray for that do not know you, those that do not know to call Jesus their Lord and Savior. We pray that your spirit would quicken their hearts, Lord, that you would move in their lives, that you would bring people into their lives that might open them up to hearing about Jesus and making him their Savior. Lord, we pray for our community and those that may be without power, those that do not have food or provision, the ability uh, to have shelter in this time of, of cold weather, and pray that you would keep them safe. Thank you for the many shelters that are around, and we pray that you would continue to work through them uh, in our community. Lord, we pray that you would be with all of our burdens and our requests this day. Continue to speak into our hearts and our minds. Help us as we listen to you. And help us each day as we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as we begin this little adventure uh, of walking through the Gospel of John this year, we'll be following through John uh, up through Easter and until the second week of May. Um, so I'll be preaching through John. I'm doing this every year. I try and follow through one of the Gospels because we are people who are followers of Jesus Christ. And therefore, I think it's really important that we pay attention to what he actually said and what he called us to do. And so our focus wants to be on the Gospels and spend some time each year uh, looking at them uh, in depth uh, as we kind of focus on that. And so that brings us to John. Now, John is, is the odd man out on the Gospels. 
mean, we have four Gospels, and three of them um, are very, very similar. The Synoptic Gospels, we call them. Uh, we figure that probably Mark was the first of those, and then Matthew and Luke use sections of Mark as well as sections from other sources to tell the stories. And each of them goes about telling them in their own way. Uh, Matthew focuses very much on the kingdom of God and, and has a very Jewish flavor to it, as if he was writing to the Jewish people. Uh, Mark is very fast-paced. In the fullness of God uh, time, Jesus comes, and there's a, there's a hecticness to that. And, and um, I and many others believe that Mark is scribing this from, from Peter, perhaps the very end of his life in prison there in Rome. Luke writes to Theophilus, a, a Greek seeker, or Greek seekers, um, and he writes Luke and then Acts and tells the story of uh, Jesus' birth and death as well as the story of the early church in the second half of that, the Luke-Acts part of the account. John, however, is different. Now, John writes to us in a different style. He has a different layout. His Greek usage is different. It's very clear if you look at the Greek that Greek is not his original language. And the whole Gospel of John has not only a different flavor, but almost a different setting. It's as if someone was looking at it from a very different perspective than Luke and Mark and Matthew were. And that's a good thing, because it gives us another perspective of Jesus. There's things in John that are not in the other Gospels, just as there are uh, stories about Jesus in the other Gospels that are not in John. John primarily takes place in uh, a Judean context, a Jerusalem context, as opposed to the Galilean context that you see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see that Jesus is in Jerusalem much more often. Um, and it is obviously the writer uh, is someone who has connection to uh, the temple and the priestly courts that is more involved in the festivals. Jesus participates in far more festivals in Jerusalem and John than he does in the other Gospels. And so it's just a very different way. And John writes differently in this way. John assumes and states very early that who Jesus is and comments frequently about the resurrection and the crucifixion that's coming and comments about, and after this they remembered back. It's almost as if the Gospel of John is written kind of back to forward. That is, it assumes you know that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross and was raised from the grave. And so the whole telling of the story from the beginning to the end is through that lens. There's no surprise. You know who he is as we go along. And so the question is, always put, do you believe? And John focuses on witnesses, like in we read it, it said uh, John, who we know as John the Baptist, came as the witness. He witnessed too. And we'll talk, you'll hear many times in the stories that there is witnesses too. And then at the end of his teachings, and he has a tendency to give us, uh, we'll look at the seven miracles. John only contains seven. Only two of those happen outside of the Jerusalem context. The rest are ones that do not contain, are not contained in the other Gospels. And he has seven I am statements. You may remember that Judy had a series of uh, people in the church writing about the I am statements last year in the newsletter. And after each of these, he'll tell the miracle, or he'll tell the teaching, the I am, and then he will expand and explain how this answers the question, who is this Jesus? So it's just a lot more uh, teaching in it, longer sections of teaching in it. It's a very different way of going about it. And it gives us a different view of Jesus, a very helpful one. So let's take a look at the text, because it's really interesting in the Gospel of John that when John, the writer of John, begins, he goes to Genesis. I know some of you have sometimes wondered how many times I can work the phrase in the beginning into a sermon and look back at Genesis, but that's really exactly what we uh, have here uh, with, with uh, John. In Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And when we get to John, it starts out by saying, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. 
You see, he goes right back to the beginning, and he wants to make this connection. As the Old Testament begins with God creating life, and the understanding that is crucial to the biblical text, and that is that all life is sacred to God. Even though sin has entered in, and we know that story from Genesis, God is continuing to work to redeem his people. Notice the passage from Isaiah that we read earlier. The light will come. Salvation will come again. It's pointing forward to Jesus. And so here, John picks up this theme again, and he says, Now, into the darkness that sin has cast in life, into the chaos that is sin and, and death in our lives, Jesus comes. The one who created in the beginning now comes a, into our lives in flesh form, bringing light and life. The reality is he comes to bring new life to us so that we might be born again. That is, that we might have new life free from the chaos and the sin and the death that has entered into the world. So as God created in the beginning, now he creates new life again through the Spirit through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So he's like starting over. He's giving us this key into how our lives can have a new beginning and a new place. And it's Jesus, the word, literally the logos, that comes and does that. Now there's a couple of interesting things about the logos, the word. It says that the word was in the beginning, the word existed. That is, we need to understand that the Christology, that is the theology of God, Jesus, that is, presented here, which is the orthodox view, is that Jesus is not a part of the created order. He was there in the beginning. The image in Genesis is that God looks down in the chaos of the waters of the deep that are flowing, then says the Spirit of the Lord was moving. The Ruach of God was hovering over the waters. And then God spoke, and there was light, and he separated the light from the darkness, God spoke, and he separated the water from the land. God spoke, and he created life and plants. He put the heavens in motion. He created all animals, and he created humans. What did he speak? He spoke the word. Jesus is the word that was in creation and now comes again. And so he was in creation there before. It says that he was with God. That is, he was beside God. He was there with God, and he was God. So he is God, but he's also something distinguishable separate from God. Jesus in himself is not all of God, but he is the part of God that comes close to us. It is the part where God comes into our presence and he tabernacles with us as we see in the text. But he was God. And so we already begin the image of the Trinity. We begin the imagery of the Christology there, the specialness of Logos, the word that was there. And we need to understand that with this, the term, the word, is going to fade, begin to fade out of John as it focuses, he starts to focus on the life and the ministry. See, that's one of the interesting things about John. He spends about equal time between the life and ministry, the first 11 chapters or so, and then he moves into that last week, that trial, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his resurrection, because the life of Jesus matters. And he will move from referring to him as the Word, just beginning to refer to him as the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus. The other thing that's introduced here right away is the term light, the image of light. When Jesus comes, he is the light of the world, as we say. And light brings life, just as it did in creation. Now it brings life again. The light brings salvation. He comes with his salvation. The light illuminates the things in the darkness, and it does two things. As it illuminates, it reveals the darkness for what it is. It's hopelessness, it's despair, it's death, it's sin, it's wrongness. But not only does it reveal the darkness, it illuminates the way to go. So it is a revealing and saying, okay, here are the things that are against your fullness of life, against God's order, the things that stand opposed to God. But it also then begins to show us the way, begins to illuminate the light. So Jesus is the light, and his life, the way he lived his life, illuminates the path that we should follow. So we are followers of Jesus. We want to live our life in the paths that he showed us to walk, not just 
showing us the darkness and the things to stay away from, but the things that we are to follow and the way we are supposed to live. He is also reminds us that the light comes and it cannot be defeated by the darkness. That is, the darkness, which is gloom and despair, it is darkness and sin and death and hopelessness and bondage, that can never overcome the light, which is joy and hope and life and understanding and truth. We need to know that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ that we are not overcome by the darkness. The darkness may still come at us. We may still have to walk through some dark and difficult times, but the light keeps guiding us, and that life is the hope of God with us today and the hope of eternal life with him as well. Now, something that the Gospel of John does is it assumes that as hearers and seers of Jesus, that we have a part to play in our belief, and that is that we have to choose. Many people see Jesus. Many people witness him with their eyes, but they do not become witnesses of his life because they never believe in him in his heart. And so we see. We see his stories. We hear his stories. And we begin to comprehend through the power of the Spirit, our spirit resonates and say, yes, that's true. And as we resonate with that and we say we believe, we then also begin to follow. And as we follow, we begin to demonstrate the life changes, that is, our new way of walking in the light as opposed to walking in the darkness. And we begin to, like the people, like John, bear witness to what God has done. But it's a choice we make. We make the choice, are we going to believe, and are we going to change and follow him? And are we going to choose to be a witness? It's interesting, the term uh, martyrain, which is witness, it's from martyr, is where we get the martyr, the one who witnesses what their death or suffering is how we think of it. But martyrain in the Greek means to witness, to bear, this is true. It's used 47 times in this gospel. 14 of them are used in reference to John the Baptist. He came to witness, he saw, he believed, and he witnessed. It's a call in this gospel for us to see, hear, and believe, but also to witness and to share. So many see the light, but they don't all witness the light. But it says that those that choose to believe are given the authority to become children of God. Those that beheld him with sight, with ears, those that beheld him in, now in Scripture and in the Word, when they choose to believe and put their faith in, it says they are given the authority the excusia in uh, the Greek, that is the strength, the right, the choice, the capacity to become children of God. We become children of God when we put our faith in this Jesus, this God who became flesh among us. And that's the amazing thing about God, that God loved us so much, as it says in John chapter 3, verse 16, that he sent his only son into the world, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. As it says here in the beginning, he tabernacled, he took on, in the Greek, sark, the flesh, and set up camp. He resided with us. This week, uh, we have the joy of having Tina's mom uh, staying with us, and um, the dog Elwood came, and Elwood has set up over here on the bed. It's Annie's bed. Annie's give up her bed for anybody. But Elwood uh, is sitting there. She has set up house. She has resided among us. We know Elwood, and we will know the results of Elwood, because Elwood sheds, too, just like Annie does. And when Elwood is gone, we will still find little bits of Elwood. God came, and he set up house. He set up in our midst, and he shares himself with us, and we get to enjoy and live in his glory and his grace and his light. Irenaeus said it this way, the early church father. He said, the word of God our Lord Jesus Christ, through his transcendent love, became what we are, that he might bring us to be what he is himself. That is, he came, the one who created the world, became part of the creation, so that he could redeem the creation and pay the price for their sins through his death and give them new life through his resurrection, so that they could become 
as he is one day in heaven. That is an amazing, amazing truth. And through him, we get to behold, we get to see God. No one else has really beheld God. He passes in front of Moses. There are times where he shares his glory with people, but they can never truly see him because we can't stand in the presence of God in our human form. Yet Jesus, who is in whom the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, came and settled among us, tabernacled among us. And in seeing him, we see the Father. He says frequently, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. And so the beauty of him coming is that we get to see who this God is that we're worshiping. We get to see him in his love and his grace and his truth. It's an amazing amount of love that draws God down from heaven, that he might become one of us. That, he would, that Jesus would take off his Shekinah glory, that he would take off his holiness in the sense of his total otherness. Not in holy living, but his otherness of holiness. That holiness of the throne room. And step down into earth and become human. And he did that so that his light might shine in the darkness, his light of his life. And as we begin to look through the story over the coming weeks at the miracles he performs, at the I am statements and the teachings that come with that, we begin to see this love. And so we always want to ask ourselves, what is it that we are hearing from God? What is the Kairos moment that we get? What is it that God would want us to get from this text? One thing to study and say, okay, I understand word. I understand light. I understand, uh, you know, the incarnation of Christ tabernacling among us. What does that mean in my life? So here's a couple things that I've thought of, and you probably have had some others that you've thought along the way. God's light shines in the darkness. It shines in the darkness of the world, but it shines in the darkness of my life. That's my hopelessness or my despair or my confusion. It's in the darkness of the world around me when I don't know the way to go, God shines his light and gives me a path. He helps me find my way in the darkness. God brings order to the chaos in the, in the creation. And then even in Jesus, he brings order to the chaos of life. And that order brings freedom and, from bondage. And I have to realize that there is some chaos in my life, just as there's chaos in your life. And that we can see in Jesus order being brought to the chaos, we can see a way through. We do not have to surrender the hopelessness or despair of life. We do not have to live without the joy of knowing that God is leading us and guiding us and putting things in place for us. So God comes to us as word, as light and life. His word, his light that shines in the darkness, and his new light that he gives us to lead. So he gives us the way to come to him. He gives us the light and the knowledge to accept him, and he gives us the path to follow. God became one of us. He took on flesh. He knows what it's like to walk in human form. It's not a God who is distant and uncaring and unknowing, but he's a God who descended down and sits with us. He remembers what it's like to feel pain and sorrow and despair. He knows what it's like to cry tears. He knows what it's like to laugh. He knows the joy of a drink of cool water on a dry throat. He knows, he knows the love of brothers and sisters and family. He knows rejection. He knows all the emotions we feel. And so when he looks down, it's not as an uncaring God who does not know or relate, but he can remember. And that is a great comfort. And also, I think it reminds us that we can become children of God through the Spirit of God, when we believe in the Word of God. It's not because we become good enough. It's not that we can control our eternal destiny. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, which comes into our lives and speaks to our hearts, which opens our eyes and our mind and our heart to Him, we can begin to comprehend the Word of God which came in through Jesus Christ and is written in our Scriptures. And we can begin through the light of God to see the path that we should take 
We can see the darkness in our lives and the sins we need to confess and run away from into the power of God and allow him to clean us and cleanse us through that light. But it also shows us the path that we should walk in. Give us the new life that comes through Jesus Christ. The life that is born of the spirit, not of the flesh. And that, that is a great joy. And one that should not only cause us to want to seek God's light and to follow more closely, to understand his word better and how we should go, but it ought to be a joy in our lives that causes us to want to share that with everyone else. I hope that each one of us becomes not only the kind of person that says, I believe and I follow, the one who says, I share that and witness that with the world. Litany at the end, we started by come and see, then we said come and follow. And the litany as we close with today, as we look at Jesus as the light of the world and the word of God who comes and set up tabernacle with us, says it this way. Go and tell. The Spirit has equipped us for service, to love our neighbors as we do ourselves, to bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Come and see, come and follow. Go and tell. In God's love, the nations of the earth will put their hope when we tell them what God has done. It's been good to have a few moments with you this morning. Stay warm and stay safe. Remember, the light of God shines in this world. And over the next few weeks, as we continue through the Gospel of John, we will celebrate the light and the word that has come and the call to believe, and the call to be a witness. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day of life, for without you there is no life. Thank you for this day where we can look at your word, for without your word we would not know you. Thank you for this day of light that shines in our darkness and gives us hope. Thank you for this day that we might turn our eyes in a fresh way upon you and follow. And thank you for the opportunities to witness that you will give us. And we, we go in the grace and the peace and the love of God, his son, Jesus Christ, the word, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Have a good day. Stay warm. Hope to see you Wednesday at Logos. and look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. Blessings. Goodbye.